Would you open your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts? As we continue through our study through this marvelous book of Acts, we find ourselves today in the book of Acts, chapter number 8, and we'll be picking up in our reading in verse number 4. So if you would go to Acts, chapter 8, and verse 4. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and Many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was much joy in that city. I'm going to work our way through these four verses today. And obviously the the context or the background of this passage is that we have found that the the church is well settled in Jerusalem. Uh, Stephen has now been martyred. Uh, Stephen has given a defense of the gospel and he has been martyred. Stephen is dead. He has just been um, buried uh, and we find that there is a man that I introduced to you last week, a man by the name of Saul, and uh, Saul is ravaging the church. He is going from house to house and he is grabbing the believers and dragging them out and, and they're stoning the believers. They're killing these believers. They're locking these believers up. They are taking these believers and they're feeding them even to the lions. I'll never forget when we were in Israel, uh, we went to uh, Caesarea by the sea and uh, there's a a hippodrome right there and and an arena right there where you can see where they would bring the the chariots in and I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Ben-Hur and that would kind of be the scene of the day and it would be there... uh, on one portion that there was a sign that says this is where the Christians were kept as they would be fed to the lions. And so for the pleasure uh, of the Caesar, uh, they would feed Christians to the lions. Uh, We are told by history that the Christians would actually take the children and throw the children to the lions first. And you would think that this is a a very bad thing. They hated their kids. Uh, I thought maybe they were all homeschoolers. But I'm just kidding, homeschoolers. I'm just kidding. I've got a whole lot of you here, so I like to mess with you a little bit. But really what they did was they figured this thing out that the lions, when they were the most hungry, would devour and eat and kill. But when they were not hungry, they would toy with their prey. And so as to allow that the children would be instantly killed, they would put the children out first so that these children would be killed, that they would not be the ones to be toyed with. And obviously the adults then would be those ones that would be toyed with by the lions. You see, the persecution of the church has been very real from the very beginning. And the persecution of the church continues today where we see many who are persecuted Uh, for their faith. Here we find the church being persecuted uh, and the saying that was the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the gospel is becoming true. It is here that God will fulfill what he had said would happen. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the utter ends of the world. Now they've been in Jerusalem, uh, they, they've been in the, in the area of Judea, uh, but now because of this persecution, the believers are being pushed out and they're going into the neighboring region called Samaria. And this is not the first time that the, the gospel is going to Samaria. You remember Jesus meeting with a Samaritan woman at the well. And he told her things that only she knew about herself. And she went back and told them about the Christ. And they would come back to meet him. And there would be many who believed in Samaria. 
And so this is not the first time that the gospel is going to Samaria. So notice first and foremost, the context of our passage is persecution. It is this that God uses to raise up these people so that they might be thrust forth into the harvest fields and that they may be thrust forth into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon had said before that the Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. The Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. And there are many times that affliction and persecution, it becomes the tool of God in the life of the believer that he might use us effectively for his kingdom. And so I say to you on this day that the church was persecuted, the church is being persecuted, and the church will continue to be persecuted. And so notice not just the persecution, but notice the people. The people here that are being persecuted, verse number 4 says, and those who were scattered went preaching the word. And so the question we ask is, who's the those who were scattered? It was the believers. It's the true believers, not those who had just made a, a, a mouth uh, um, confession of, of, of the Christ, but they were the ones that could be identified by their lifestyle as the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there are many today that have a confession of mouth, but there's no confession of life. And they were noticeable. They were the ones, you knew where to find them. Saul was going from house to house, and he was bringing them out as they were, were meeting together for the cause of Christ. And he would bring them out to persecute them. You see, with believers, it's very evident who they are. They are not undercover, but they are those that are living out what Christ has called them to. Did he not say that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Did he not say that we should shine, that we should be the ones that would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are we not to be the ones that would affect our community? And I believe that these people who were scattered were the believers that they could tell who they were. And they were being persecuted for who they were and not so much of what they were doing. They were believers. And they had come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. They had come face to face with their own sinfulness. They had come face to face with their absolute need for salvation. And so it is that they would cast themselves wholly upon the Lord Jesus. And this would cost them their very lives. This is the people who are persecuted. But notice the people who are persecuted, they had a preoccupation. And here it is. They went about preaching the word. That was their preoccupation. I, 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 I'm drawn by that because I think of how many times when we struggle and we suffer, we go around moping and complaining and griping, but not them. These who were thrust out, they were scattered. They were leaving Jerusalem, going into an area, uh, into Samaria, and it was there that they were not going about moping and griping and complaining, but they were going about preaching the word. A very interesting word is used here. Euangelizo is the word that is used for preaching. Euangelizo. And really what it means, it is the gospel preaching. It is bringing forth the good news. It is presenting people with the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It is bringing forth the word, the truth. You know, in the times in which we live in, uh, we know that there are many that turn away from the truth. And they turn aside to myths and seeking that which will tickle their itching ears. And they heap unto themselves the teachers that will teach what they want to hear. Well, notice that these people who were thrust forth, these who were being persecuted, were preoccupied with the good news. Euangelizo, the preaching of the good news. The preaching of the gospel. They were preoccupied with the good news. 
I can just think about how they could have gone forth and said, you know, let me tell you how tough it is to be a Christian. And, and it's really going to be tough. And, you know, life is just uh, so difficult. And, uh, you know, we, we, we were in Jerusalem and there's this young man by the name of Saul. Now, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. And with regards to the law, you know, he's a Pharisee. Uh, he, he is a man who's blameless. Uh, he is a man who is of high standing uh, in the community. And we that have now been persecuted by this man, it's a terrible thing that has happened to us. But you know what? Oh, Jesus is worth it. No, no, I, I believe that they were preaching the good news. They were saying regardless of that which is happening to us, we, we know the good news. And the good news is this, that we were sinners headed for hell. But there came a, a Christ who died upon a cross and He gave His life that we might live. This is good news. Listen to the good news. You have an opportunity to place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is good news. And this is what they were preoccupied with. It has been well said, a religion, if your religion cannot change you, you need to change your religion. If your relationship cannot change you, you may want to change your relationship. Once you've come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe we are changed in an instant. It is, you cannot come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and, and leave unchanged. A, a true confrontation, a, a, a true coming face to face with the Lord will always have a lasting effect of change in the life of the believer. A, he will put in your heart a new song, he will put in your mind the thoughts to think, and He will give you the attitudes and the desires to want to live according to what He desires. To love what He loves and to hate what He hates. To desire to be pleasing to the King at all times. Obediently fulfilling what He's called us to. Go ye therefore into all the nations and to make disciples. They were preoccupied with the preaching of the Word of God, the Gospel. But notice, there's not only spoken here of these people, but then we're introduced to this man by the name of Philip. Listen to verse 8, sorry, verse number 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Philip, we've been introduced to him in chapter 6. You remember chapter 6 when they were going to choose those men who would serve the Hellenists and these men are chosen and two men that really stand out from that crowd is a man by the name of Stephen and he was martyred and now we hear about a man by the name of Philip. And Philip, we know, was filled with the Spirit of God. We know that he was of good repute. We know that he was a man who could be trusted and he was a man who was well known by the believers and this is evidenced in chapter 6 but notice with Philip this preacher that he's an evangelist and he's going now out and he's proclaiming and God is using him in a very effective manner with the proclamation of Christ you may ask how effective is he I'm going to read just the next portion, but I really want to be there next week. So I'm just going to touch it, and then we'll come back there next week. But if you'll go on to the next section, I'm going to start reading to you in verse 9. It says, But there was a man named Simon, now this is in Samaria, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. So this Simon guy is saying, I'm great, and he's practicing magic. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. 
But listen now what happens when Philip walks on to the scene. Verse 12. But when, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that because you're going to find out something about Simon next week. But I want you to know this, that this was a very effective tool in the hand of God. That even the man who could do magic, a man that was deceiving the people, the man, they even said that he is the power of God. Not that he has the power of God, but he is the power of God. Uh, that when they heard Philip, they believed and were baptized. And this man who thought he was great, too, believed and was baptized. You see, Philip was a sharp tool in the hand of God. Philip was the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice there's a different word that's used here in Acts chapter 8. With verse number, number 4, we find that they were preaching the word, but Philip was proclaiming to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and they saw the signs that he did. Philip was all about proclaiming to them the Christ. It's a different word that is used here. Preaching, we said, is that word euangelizo, where the word proclaiming, uh, proclaiming is the word keruso, keruso. A caruso means a loud proclamation that is made by a herald or a messenger making a proclamation. And this would be the idea of a, 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 a man standing on the wall, looking out, scanning the area, and right in the, in the deepest dark over there, he sees this little cloud of dust starting and then he sees this this horse getting closer and closer to the castle wall and and, and he starts hearing this man is shouting something and this man is coming with a loud proclamation saying something like this the, the king has been killed or uh, send reinforcements or whatever it was it was a, a loud proclamation it was something to be said it would be in the same thing as in the Roman world when they would send uh, a herald into the towns as an ambassador. And he would say, hear he, hear he. On this day, Caesar is taking himself a new wife. And everyone would stop and they would listen. Philip proclaimed Christ. Hear he, hear he. On this day, the God of creation, the eternal one, in his sovereignty, has chosen to send his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Not to be debated, not to be argued, but to be proclaimed. Hear ye, hear ye, on this day, that this Jesus Christ was not only crucified, but he was raised from the dead. He has ascended on high. He was received and, and a coronation service was held in heaven for him. This is the King of Kings. This is the Christ. Not some good teacher. Not, no, not some therapist. Uh, not some psychobabble guy. Not some good example to follow, but that He is the Son of God, God the Son. Hear ye, hear ye, on this day, Jesus Christ, the sinless one, the Lamb of God, took away the sin of the world. Proclaiming Christ. Not proclaiming five ways to have a happy marriage. And three ways to drive your car and six ways to become healthy, wealthy, and wise. Two ways to plant a church and seven ways to love your wife and kill your kids. Oh, sorry, did I just say that? No. No, no, the proclamation was very clear. Proclaiming Christ. You see, the evangelist, 
Philip as he proclaimed Christ, I believe that it was not just in word, but in life too. It says they believed because they saw the signs. There were many spirits that came out of those who were possessed. There were the paralyzed, the lame began to walk. They were healed. These signs, these divine signs were a divine confirmation of his divine revelation. He was revealing to them no longer just the God of creation and history and conscience, but now he was, pro he was providing them with the knowledge and proclaiming the God of the Bible. He was proclaiming Jesus and the proof of his claims about the Christ was the signs that he did. You may ask today, well, what about us? Should we be? Well, I'm going to say this, that you can say and talk about Jesus all day until you're blue in your face and live like hell and no one's going to listen because there's no power in that. People are always looking. They want to see an evidence. They want to see that we're not just proclaiming him with our mouths, but we are demonstrating his heart, that we are the ones who are living out his word, that there has been a change in our lives. You see, we are all walking billboards for someone. And constantly, as people hear us sharing the truth of who Christ is, they are either drawn to him or repelled. Many times what repels people is the works of those who are proclaiming. I have become at times very cynical when I see billboards have your windshield fixed here and then they have the big fish to say they're Christians. Or a man giving you his business card to sell you insurance and he's got the fish on there to say he's a Christian. Listen, I don't want to see the billboard. I don't want to see the card. I want to see a life that's been changed by the explosive power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, people are watching. And as they are listening to this man proclaiming Christ, they are also seeing that which is the evidence of the truth. But notice the product. The preacher and his proclamation. Now notice with me the product. Verse 7 said, For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was much joy in that city. The product of salvations, the product of, of a mighty working of God, a product of joy. Joy. You know, it's impossible to know joy or to have joy in your life without knowing Jesus. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You can go on and run through them if you want. But joy, joy is this word that comes from the word chara, and it means this gladness or good tidings. It's the same word that is used uh, in the book of Luke chapter 2. You know the story very well, but I'm going to read a short portion of it to you. Luke chapter number 2, and I'm going to start reading to you from verse number 8, and I'm going to put an emphasis on verse number 11. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, and they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, and they were filled with great fear. Now listen to verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for, I, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. What's for all people? 
the great joy, the good news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Joy. I bring to you great tidings of joy. You see, joy exceeds this happiness. Joy is that inner peace of knowledge that God is in control. It is living even when we have a difficulty on the outside and we feel like we're being pressed and pushed and persecuted that we can live with an inner joy in knowing that our God is in control. It's impossible to have joy in your life if you don't have Christ in your life. And so I commit this passage to you on this day and say this, Believers have always been persecuted, will always be persecuted, and are currently being persecuted. The people who are persecuted are those that give their lives to Jesus Christ. Do not let this hinder you. Count the cost and abandon yourself with a reckless abandonment to Jesus Christ. Be preoccupied with the good news. Know that God is calling people to be preachers who will be about the proclamation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your labor is not in vain. Give yourself fully to it. Because God will use that meager little bit that we can give to bring glory to himself. Would you give yourself to that? Would you be willing to work with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength for the cause of Christ? Would you be willing to count the cost and give it all to Him? You see, the persecution of these believers resulted in the salvation of of many, even in a region where those that lived there were viewed to be bastards, half breeds, those that were of no significance. But God used the persecuted believers to bring the gospel, to bring tidings of great joy. Will you be obedient in doing just that? You see, at Lakeland Church, we have a lot of opportunities for you to do that. We have opportunities for you to do that through our missions, uh, going out on missions, going out on disaster relief. We do a soup kitchen. We provide food for our local school. We provide um, the needed resources for our middle school. We're loving on the teachers. We have Sunday school. We have a good news club. You have worship services. You have Wednesday night worship services. We have prayer groups. There's so many different opportunities for you to get plugged in where you can make a difference for Christ. You see, we are not brought into the kingdom uh, to become citizens that have no use. But he has given us all a spiritual gift that we are to deploy for his good and for his glory. Oh, how I encourage you today. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. But you're going to want to have to be used. In this passage, we have seen the church now booming. And it's all because those that were persecuted were willing to do what God had commanded. The great commission should never be the great omission of the church. The Great Commission should never be viewed as a great suggestion. We are all about the proclamation of Christ. May we as a church give ourselves fully to that. The church is not the organization. The church is each individual believer. You are the church. God wants to use you individually. My challenge to you today is this. Stop looking around at others and look to yourself and say, what am I doing 
for the kingdom of God? What is God doing through me in the kingdom of God? What should I be doing in order to be obedient to the Lord? You see, God has a plan. His plan is a plan of redemption. And He uses His believers to spread that word that it might be accomplished through faith in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads as we close in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are the God that is in absolute control of all things. Thank you that as we saw in our passage, even when these people's world was turned upside down as they were persecuted, that your hand was still upon them, that you had never lost control, that your will was still being accomplished. I thank you, God, for the plan that you have for Lake Laura Baptist Church. So many ministries and so many needs that are being met. So many more needs that we, we just don't have the resources to meet. But God, you do. And this church belongs to you. So God, if you're going to use us, we pray that you would provide everything that we need. That we would be able to meet the needs of our community. That we would be able to proclaim the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that you would provide all we need that we might demonstrate your heart to this community that you would give us the ability just to surrender to your Holy Spirit that he might live your life through us. We might be surrendered so that all will see that in the life of this church, its members, we have drawn a line in the sand and we're going to stand and fight for you. So, Father, each one in this room has a different need and a, a different concern. Each one in this room is facing different challenges in their lives, and some are facing victories. And, Lord, I just praise you for the fact that you know where each person finds themselves today. There is nothing that is hidden from your sight. But you're the God that sees all things, you know all things. The greatest thing, God, is you're the God that is always present amidst all that. And you're able to do all things. So I pray for each one in this room that you would show yourself to be the all-sufficient God. That we all would be able to say with a resounding voice, Jesus is enough. And I pray this in Jesus' name.